Hello, fifth graders, and welcome back from break. I hope you had an excellent, amazing, restful, and fun break, and it was everything that you had hoped it would be. If you feel up to it, I'd love for you to just tell me in a comment, in your private message, something you did, something fun, something exciting, something you read. I'd love to know how your break was, so give me a little bit of something to tell me how it was. Um, I'm excited to be back. I loved having break, but it's also nice to be back at it, right, and doing some work together and being together. So I'm excited to be connecting again. Um, little women might be in the backs of your brains right now, but we'll get back into it. So for today, you're going to need your copy of Little Women. And again, this paper pencil thing really comes down to if you have been writing down answers as you're going. And, and also remember, I kind of keep suggesting if you've been struggling, then writing down answers or writing down page numbers as you go can be really helpful. So go ahead and get those things. Um, first thing we're going to do is go over our answers from chapter 13, which was more than two weeks ago, like probably close to two and a half weeks ago is the Thursday before break. But maybe going over the answers will kind of jog your memory about where we left off on Little Women. So here we go. Okay, this is the chapter when all of the characters were reflecting on what they had dreamed about for the future, the castles. So what was Laurie's dream for his future? His dream was to settle in Germany and play music. <clears throat> Meg's dream is to have a luxurious house full of servants. Joe's dream was to be an author who is rich and famous. Beth's dream was to stay at home and help take care of the family. Amy's dream was to live in Rome and be the best artist in the world. And then a quote that shows that Lori's trying to improve his character. So you want to make sure your answer said... A quote that shows that Lori is trying to improve his character is. There were a few quotes, particularly towards the end of the chapter. I saw a lot of you pick, I'll let my castle go and stay with the dear old gentleman while he needs me, for I am all he has. So this reflection that Lori maybe won't leave his grandfather um, in the end. To which theme does this relate? Again, you might have picked a different quote, but anytime we're really talking about an improvement of character, this is going to relate to virtue. Um, so you would have the theme that this relates to is the importance of living a virtuous life. Okay, so thinking about, you know, self-improvement, character improvement will relate to virtue. And then question eight was about this word contentedly, which means, you know, satisfied. So the, the sentence, the cat rested in the warm sun contentedly would be the correct choice. Uh, so for today, moving on to chapter 14, our questions. One, where does Lori think that Joe is going? Two, what does Joe ask of Lori? Three, what is Joe's secret? So this one, we will know. The author will tell us Joe's secret. Four, though, what do you infer that Lori's secret was? We aren't going to know. This is really our main objective for today. It's going to be inferring about some things that are whispered between Joe and Lori that we don't get to hear. Both of these, remember, are complete sentences. Joe's secret was, and I infer that Lori's secret was. And then what is one quote that supports your inference? So what quote from the text helps to support the inference that you're making about what Lori's secret was? And again, you'd say one quote that supports my inference is. Number six, why does Meg scold Joe? Seven, why are Joe and Lori excited? And eight, which of the following sentences correctly uses the word nettled? So with that, fifth graders, we're going to get into today's reading. And again, our objective here, making an inference. So we've been talking about inferences throughout. So remember that an inference is something that the author does not tell us, okay? We don't know, but we look at some clues that are provided from the text. So what do we know? And then what logical conclusion can we draw from that? What inference? And so as I've hinted from the questions, Joe and Lori are going to have a conversation. We're going to have parts of it that we'll know what they'll say, but parts of it we're not given the perspective of. They're whispering and we don't know what it is. So we have to look at <clears throat> what does the author tell us about facial expressions or reactions or other words surrounding it. So we'll really kind of hash it out as we're going through and try to figure out what our inference should be. 
So we're on page 149 in your text, chapter 14, titled Secrets. And we're going to get back into it. Remember, it's been a while. So remember that as we're reading, you should be listening to me, but your eyes should be on the page. That's what's going to help you improve as a reader. So make sure that you're tracking along with me as you go, reading those words as you hear them. <clears throat> Joe was very busy in the garret, for the October days began to grow chilly, and the afternoons were short. For two or three hours, the sun lay warmly in the high window, showing Joe seated on the old sofa, writing busily with her papers spread out upon a trunk before her, while Scrabble, the pet rat, promenaded the beams overhead, accompanied by her oldest son a fine young fellow who was evidently very proud of his whiskers. Quite absorbed in her work, Jo scribbled away till the last page was filled, when she signed her name with a flourish and threw her pen down, exclaiming, There, I've done my best. If this won't suit, I shall have to wait till I can do better. Lying back on the sofa, she read the manuscript carefully through, making dashes here and there and putting in many exclamation points, which looked like little balloons. Then she tied it up with a smart red ribbon and sat a minute looking at it with a sober, wistful expression, which plainly showed how earnest her work had been. Joe's desk up here was an old tin kitchen. The footnote tells us it's like a covered pot. So when we say kitchen, she's kind of using a covered pot to write on, which hung against the wall. In it, she kept her papers and a few books safely shut away from Scrabble, who, being likewise of a literary turn, was fond of making a circulating library of such books as were left in his way by eating the leaves. So if she leaves any papers out, the rat chews through them. From this tin receptacle, Joe produced another manuscript, and putting both in her pocket, crept quietly downstairs, leaving her friends to nibble her pens and taste her ink. So she's taken two manuscripts, which are like drafts of a book, with her. She put on her hat and jacket as noiselessly as possible, and going to the back entry window, got out upon the roof of a low porch, swung herself down to the grassy bank, and took a roundabout way to the road. Once there, she composed herself, hailed a passing omnibus, and rolled away to town, looking very merry and mysterious. So she's headed to town um, with two of her manuscripts. If anyone had been watching her, he would have thought her movements decidedly peculiar. For on alighting, she went off at a great pace till she reached a certain number in a certain busy street. Having found the place with some difficulty, she went into the doorway, looked up the dirty stairs, and after standing stuck still a minute, suddenly dived into the street and walked away as rapidly as she came. This maneuver she repeated several times, to the great amusement of a black-eyed young gentleman lounging in the window of a building opposite. On returning for a third time, Jo gave herself a shake, pulled her hat over her eyes, and walked up the stairs, looking as if she were going to have all her teeth out. Okay, so what do we conclude? What is the narrator indicating to us as, as this, at this description of Jo? Jo has taken uh, transportation into town. She walks very quickly to the building that she's looking for. She gets to the building, she walks in the door, and then she stops and stares up the steps. And then she rushes back out into the street. And she kind of pulls herself together, walks back in, stops. And then she rushes back out into the street. And then she kind of pulls herself together one more time and walks in a third time. So what do we conclude Joe is feeling? What emotion is she feeling if she keeps coming to where she's going and then kind of rushing away and then trying again and then rushing away? What kind of emotion would that be? Seems like she's maybe kind of scared that she's worried about this. And the narrator describes it looks like she's going to have all her teeth pulled out. Okay. We also get this description of there's somebody sitting across the way at a window and is watching her doing this and finding it very amusing. And it says that it's a certain black-eyed young gentleman. So we have to remember, we've kind of talked about this, the description of black eyes and brown eyes. We have two characters. So black eyes is how Lori is described. Lori is described as having black eyes. And then Mr. Brooke, we know, has been described as having brown eyes. So Lori appears to be across the street, sitting there and watching Joe kind of attempting to go into this building and then rushing away in fear. There was a dentist sign, among others, which adorned the entrance. So above this building, there is, excuse me, <clears throat> a dentist sign, but there's also a bunch of other signs. But Lori notices this dentist sign. And after staring a moment at the pair of artificial jaws, which slowly opened and shut to draw attention to a fine set of teeth, 
the young gentleman put on his coat, took his hat, and went down to post himself in the opposite doorway, saying with a smile and a shiver, it's like her to come alone. But if she has a bad time, she'll need someone to help her home. So we're kind of seeing a little bit of hinting, right? The narrator says that Joe looks as if she's going to get all her teeth pulled out, okay? Lori sees this. He also sees that this building has many signs on it, but one of the signs is for, denti for a dentist. And so jo Lori's thinking, oh, I should go help her. It would be just like her to come to the dentist on her own, but I should go wait because she might be having some trouble and she might need help getting home. If you've ever had teeth pulled, right? It's painful and sometimes you have meds to help and it makes you kind of loopy. So Lori's gonna go wait. So at this point, this is Lori's thought um, and also the answer to question one. But we need to be reflecting on the fact that we know that Joe brought something with her when she went to this building. She brought something with her, which you probably wouldn't need to bring to the dentist. So maybe she's not actually going to the dentist, but let's keep reading. In 10 minutes, Joe came running downstairs with a very red face and the general appearance of a person who had just passed through a trying ordeal of some sort. When she saw the young gentleman, she looked anything but pleased, so she's not happy to see Lori, and passed him with a nod. But he followed, asking with an air of sympathy, did you have a very bad time? Again, what is Lori asking about when he asks if she had a bad time? Yeah, the dentist, okay? Not very. You got through quickly. Yes, thank goodness. Why did you go alone? Didn't want anyone to know. You were the oddest fellow I ever saw. How many did you have out? So again, Lori's asking about the dentist and says, why'd you go alone? And she says, I didn't want anyone to know. And Lori's like, you didn't want anyone to know you went to the dentist? How odd. And then he asks, how many did you have out? How many what is Lori asking about? How many teeth, right? How many teeth did you have out? Joe looked at her friend as if she did not understand him, then began to laugh as if mightily amused at something. So Joe looks like, huh? And then she figures out what Lori thinks and starts laughing really hard. There are two which I want to have come out, but I must wait a week. What are you laughing at? You are up to some mischief, Joe, said Lori, looking mystified. So are you. What were you doing, sir, up in that billiard saloon? So Laurie's like, something's up here, but he still doesn't know what. And we actually still don't know what, unless you're kind of making it an inference. This is not the inference we're making today, but an inference about what Joe is doing with her two manuscripts. And she went to this building and she says, I'd like to have two out, but I have to wait. Okay. So maybe you're starting to think about this. And then she asks him what he's doing in that billiard saloon. So billiards is like another word for pool, like playing on a pool table. And a saloon is typically a place where you would be able to go get alcohol. So she's asking him, what are you doing in a place that has pool, which often goes with gambling and, and alcohol? Begging your pardon, ma'am, it wasn't a billiard saloon, but a gymnasium. And I was taking lesson in fencing. I'm glad of that. Why? You can teach me. And then when we play Hamlet, you can be Laertes and we'll make a fine thing of the fencing scene. Lori burst out with a hearty boy's laugh, which made several passers-by smile in spite of themselves. I'll teach you whether we play Hamlet or not. It's grand fun and we'll straighten you up capitally. But I don't believe that was your only reason for saying, I'm glad, in that decided way, was it now? No, I was glad that you were not in the saloon, because I hope you never go to such places. Do you? Not often. I wish you wouldn't. It's no harm, Joe. I have billiards at home, but it's no fun unless you have good players. So, as I'm fond of it, I come sometimes and have a game with Ned Moffat or some of the other fellows. Oh, dear, I'm so sorry, for you'll get to liking it better and better, and we'll waste time and money and grow like those dreadful boys. I did hope you'd stay respectable and be a satisfaction to your friends, said Joe, shaking her head. So Joe's really indicating the March family, they don't really often drink alcohol, they don't gamble. And so she's saying like, I really wish you wouldn't do that, right? And you're gonna, it's gonna change you. Can a fellow take a little innocent amusement now and then without losing his respectability? Asked Lori, looking nettled, who's getting irritated with her. That depends upon how and where he takes it. I don't like Ned and his set and wish you'd keep out of it. Mother won't let us have him, him at our house, though he wants to come. And if you grow like him, she won't be willing to have us frolic together as we do now. Won't she? asked Lori anxiously. 
no, she can't bear fashionable young men, and she'd shut us all up in band boxes rather than have us associate with them. Well, she needn't get out her band boxes yet. I'm not a fashionable party and don't mean to be, but I do like harmless larks now and then, don't you? Yes, nobody minds them, so lark away, but don't get wild, will you? Or there will be an end of all our good times. That was our answer to question two. So Lori's concerned because she knows if that Lori starts to, or not Lori, Joe is concerned. Because if Lori starts to act like some of the other boys, their mother will tell them they can't spend time with them. She kind of limits who they can spend time with. I'll be a double distilled saint. I can't bear saints. Just be simple, honest, respectable boy. And we'll never desert you. I don't know what I should do if you acted like Mr. King's son. He had plenty of money, but didn't know how to spend it and got tipsy and gambled and ran away and forged his father's name. I believe, and was altogether horrid. You think I'm likely to do the same? Much obliged. So Lori's kind of offended. Like, you're saying I would do that? How rude. No, I don't. Oh, dear, no. But I hear people talking about money being such a temptation, and I sometimes wish you were poor. I shouldn't worry then. Do you worry about me, Joe? A little when you look moody or discontented, as you sometimes do. For you've got such a strong will. If you once get started wrong, I'm afraid it would be hard to stop you. Lori walked in silence a few minutes, and Joe watched him, wishing she had held her tongue, for his eyes looked angry, though his lips still smiled at her warnings. Are you going to deliver lectures all the way home? He asked presently. Of course not. Why? Because if you are, I'll take the bus. If you are not, I'd like to walk with you and tell you something very interesting. I won't preach any more, and I'd like to hear the news immensely. Well, very well then, come on. It's a secret, and if I tell you, you must tell me yours. I haven't got any, began Joe, but stopped suddenly, remembering that she had. You know you have. You can't hide anything, so up and fess, or I won't tell, cried Lori. Is your secret a nice one? Oh, isn't it? All about people you know, and such fun. You ought to hear it, and I've been aching to tell it this long time. Come, you begin. You'll not say anything about it at home, will you? Not a word. And you won't tease me in private? I never tease. Yes, you do. You get everything you want out of people. I don't know how you do it, but you are a born wheedler. Thank you. Fire away. Well, this is Joe's secret. I've left two stories with a newspaper man, and he's to give his answer next week, whispered Joe in her confidant's ear. Hurrah for Miss March, the celebrated American authoress, cried Lori, throwing up his hat and catching it again, to the great delight of two ducks, four cats, five hens, and half a dozen Irish children, for they were out of the city now. Hush, it won't come to anything, I dare say, but I couldn't rest till I had tried, and I said nothing about it because I didn't want anyone else to be disappointed. It won't fail. Why, Joe, your stories are works of Shakespeare compared to half the rubbish that is published every day. Won't it be fun to see them in print, and shan't we feel proud of our authoress? Joe's eyes sparkled, for it is always pleasant to be believed in, and a friend's praise is always sweeter than a dozen newspaper puffs. So now you can see why Joe is laughing, right? Lori kept asking questions, assuming that Joe was getting her teeth pulled out. So he said, how many did you get out? And she said, I hope to have two out, but I have to wait. So what is she talking about? Yeah, two stories, right? She's got these stories, and she's hoping that they'll get published in the newspaper. So that's Joe's secret. What's your secrets? This is where we have to start really doing our inferring here and looking at the clues that are provided. What's your secret? Play fair, Teddy, or I'll never believe you again, she said, trying to extinguish the brilliant hopes that blazed up at a word of encouragement. I may get into a scrape for telling, but I didn't promise not to, so I will, for I never feel easy in my mind till I've told you any plummy bit of news I get. I know where Meg's glove is. Is that all, said Joe, looking disappointed, as Lori nodded and twinkled with a face full of mysterious intelligence. So this is now many weeks ago, fifth graders, but you remember when they started with the post office and they were passing things back and forth and Meg gets just the one glove, right? And 
she asks Beth, like, didn't you drop the other glove? And Beth's like, no, I, I assure you I didn't, right? And so that kind of, it went away then. But Joe, or Lori's now indicating that he knows where the glove is. And Joe's like, is that it? No big deal. So here's Lori. It's quite enough for the present, as you'll agree when I tell you where it is. Tell then. Lori bent and whispered three words in Joe's ear, which produced a comical change. So this is the secret, right? We know that he's telling Joe some words. He whispers them and it produces some effect from Joe. So now we have to start looking at our clues to help make our inference. She stood and stared at him for a minute, looking both surprised and displeased, then walked on saying sharply, how do you know? Saw it. Where? Pocket. All this time? Yes. Isn't that romantic? No, it's horrid. Don't you like it? Of course I don't. It's ridiculous. It won't be allowed. My patience. What would Meg say? You are not to tell anyone. Mind that. I didn't promise. That was understood. And I trusted you. Well, I won't for the present anyway, but I'm disgusted and wish you hadn't told me. I thought you'd be pleased. At the idea of anybody coming to take Meg away? No, thank you. You'll feel better about it when somebody comes to take you away. I'd like to see anyone try it, cried Joe fiercely. So should I, and Lori chuckled at the idea. I don't think secrets agree with me. I feel rumpled up in my mind since you told me that said Joe rather ungratefully. Race down this hill with me and you'll be all right, suggested Lori. All right, we're going to pause there and really think about this inference, right? So the secret definitely is that Lori knows where Meg's other glove is, but that's not the answer that I want you guys to write because that's not an inference. He told us that. That's something we know. So the inference that we're trying to make at this point is where, when he whispers in Joe's ear where it is, where is it? So clues, there's all kinds of clues. He tells her, and Joe looks very surprised and very displeased, which means whatever he told her, she didn't like it. She didn't like what he had to say. And he says he saw it, and she asks him where he saw it, and he says, a pocket. I saw it in a pocket. Okay, so that's another clue. It's in a pocket. It's in somebody's pocket. Again, that's not an inference, so we're not going to give that as our answer. It's not an inference. And she says, it's been in this pocket all the time since this was lost. And he says, yes, isn't it romantic? So that's another clue at this point. Whatever, wherever it is, it has something to do with romance, okay? It's a romantic thing, which not surprisingly, Joe says, no, it's awful, okay? Ridiculous, right? And she kind of talks about how awful it is. Okay, so then Lori said, you know, I thought you would have liked this. And she says that the idea of somebody coming to take Meg away, no, thank you. So what does that mean? We've got some clues. It's in a pocket. Lori thinks it's romantic. Joe talks about somebody coming to take Meg away. What does that mean? She's not getting arrested. It's not like someone's coming to take her away to jail. So what would it mean if someone would come to take Meg away? You have to think about what does that mean? Why would Meg move away from the family? And Lori says, well, you'll like it when it happens to you. So whatever it is, it's not a bad thing. However, Joe's response is, yeah, right. I'd like to see somebody come and try to take me away. So again, why? What romantic thing would lead someone to be taken away? And in the end, she's upset about this whole thing. So your inference at this point, we know it's in someone's pocket. We know that Lori thinks it's romantic. We know that the idea Joe has is that it's going to lead to Meg moving away from the family. So when you're talking about number four and inferring Lori's secret, I infer that Lori's secret was in blank's pocket. Whose pocket? Okay. And so we have to do some inferring at this point about whose pocket it is. That would be a romantic thing and would be a moving away thing, moving out of the house. Okay. I'm giving a lot of hints, guidance about what your answer should look like, okay? I'm excited to see what you infer. And then number five, I ask you to pick a quote that supports your inference. I have a lot of 
things in the chapter. So you could pick something in this chapter or you could pick something in an older chapter if you want to pick an older chapter to help support your inference. And there's lots in the older chapter. There's kind of like little hints and, and things and tips all the way throughout. So as you're supporting that inference and you're picking a quote, it could be a quote from our, our current chapter or it could be a quote from a previous chapter, okay? Can't wait. Okay, so now Joe's upset about this and Lori says, let's race down the hill. No one was in sight. The smooth road sloped invitingly before her, and finding the temptation irresistible, Joe darted away, soon leaving hat and comb behind her and scattering hairpins as she ran. Lori reached the goal first and was quite satisfied with the success of his treatment, for his Atlanta came panting up with flying hair, bright eyes, ruddy cheeks, and no sign of dissatisfaction in her face. I wish I was a horse. Then I could run for miles in this splendid air and not lose my breath. It was capital, but see what a guy it's made me. Go pick up my things like a cherub as you are, said Joe, dropping down under a maple tree, which was carpeting the bank with crimson leaves. Lori leisurely departed to recover the lost property, and Joe bundled up her braids, hoping no one would pass by till she was tidy again. But someone did pass, and who should it be but Meg, looking particularly ladylike in her state and festival suit, for she had been making calls. What in the world are you doing here, she asked, regarding her disheveled sister with well-bred surprise. Giving leaves, meekly answered Joe, sorting a rosy handful she had just swept up. And hairpins, added Lori, throwing half a dozen into Joe's lap. They grow on this road, Meg. So do combs and brown straw hats. You have been running, Joe. How could you? When will you stop such romping ways, said Meg reprovingly, as she settled her cuffs and smoothed her hair, with which the wind had taken liberties. We just saw another answer. Never, till I'm stiff and old and have to use a crutch. Don't try to make me grow up before my time, Meg. It's hard enough to have you change all of a sudden. Let me be a little girl as long as I can. So we see Joe's getting kind of testy, right? And this is partially because of the secret she just heard. And so she's having this reaction to Meg, like, I'm a kid and I'm going to keep being a kid and you can't make me grow up. And it's bad enough that you're trying to grow up. So Joe is irritated, but Meg doesn't exactly know why. As she spoke, Joe bent over the leaves to hide the trembling of her lips. And again, that trembling of the lips is telling us that Joe feels really upset enough that she wants to cry. For lately, she had felt that Margaret was fast getting to be a woman, and Lori's secret made her dread the separation, which must surely come some time, and now seemed very near. He saw the trouble in her face and drew Meg's attention from it by asking quickly, where have you been calling all so fine? At the gardener's, and Sally has been telling me all about Belle Moffat's wedding. It was very splendid, and they have gone to spend the winter in Paris. Just think how delightful that must be. Do you envy her, Meg? said Lori. I'm afraid I do. I'm glad of it, muttered Joe, tying on her hat with a jerk. Why? asked Meg, looking surprised. So Joe says that she's glad that Meg envies that her friend Belle had a really expensive wedding and a really expensive honeymoon. And so Meg says, why? Because, says Joe, if you care much about riches, you will never go and marry a poor man, said Joe, frowning at Lori, who was mutely warning her to mind what she said. So Fitzgerald, that's actually kind of another clue about your inference, if you kind of want to dig into that a little bit and think about that a little bit. I shall never go and marry anyone, observed Meg, walking on with great dignity, while the others followed laughing, whispering, skipping stones, and behaving like children, as Meg said to herself, though she might have been tempted to join them if she had not had her best dress on. For a week or two, Jo behaved so queerly that her sisters were quite bewildered. She rushed to the door when the postman rang, was rude to Mr. Brooke whenever they met, would sit looking at Meg with a woe-begone face, occasionally jumping up to shake, and then to kiss her in a very mysterious manner. Lori and she were always making signs to one another and talking about spread eagles till the girls declared that they had both lost their wits. On the second Saturday after Joe got out of the window, Meg, as she sat sewing at her, win at her window, was scandalized by the sight of Lori chasing Joe all over the garden and finally capturing her in Amy's bower. What went on there, Meg could not see, but shrieks of laughter were heard, followed by the murmur of voices and a great flapping of newspapers. 
What shall we do with that girl? She never will behave like a young lady, sighed Meg as she watched the race with a disapproving face. I hope she won't. She is so funny and dear as she is, said Beth, who had never betrayed that she was a little hurt at Joe's having secrets with anyone but her. It's very t trying, but we never can make her commie la foe, added Amy. So again, one of her misspeakings, who sat making some new frills for herself with her curls tied up in a very becoming way. Two agreeable things which made her feel unusually elegant and ladylike. In a few minutes, Joe bounced in, laid herself on the sofa, and affected to read. Have you anything interesting there? asked Meg with condescension. Nothing but a story. Won't amount to much, I guess, returned Joe, carefully keeping the name of the paper out of sight. You'd better read it aloud. That will amuse us and keep you out of mischief, said Amy in her most grown-up tone. What's the name? asked Beth, wondering why Joe kept her face behind the sheet. The Rival Painters. That sounds well. Read it, said Meg. With a loud <clears throat> and a long, long breath, Joe began to read very fast. The girls listened with interest, for the tale was romantic and somewhat pathetic as most of the characters died in the end. I like that about the splendid picture, was Amy's approving remark as Joe paused. I prefer the lovering part. Viola and Angelo are two of our favorite names. Isn't that queer, said Meg, wiping her eyes, for the lovering part was tragical. Who wrote it? asked Beth, who had caught a glimpse of Joe's face. The reader suddenly sat up, cast away the paper, displaying a flushed countenance, and with a funny mixture of solemnity and excitement, replied in a loud voice, Your sister. You? cried Meg, dropping her work. It's very good, said Amy critically. I knew it. Oh, I knew it. Oh, my Joe, I am so proud. And Beth ran to hug her sister and exult over this splendid success. So we learn that Joe, in the end, does get her stories published. Dear me, how delighted they are, all were, to be sure. How Meg wouldn't believe it till she saw the words Miss Josephine March actually printed in the paper. How graciously Amy criticized the artistic parts of the story and offered hints for a sequel, which unfortunately couldn't be carried out as the hero and the heroine were dead. How Beth got excited and skipped and sang with joy. How Hannah came in to exclaim, Sakes alive! Well, I never! In great astonishment at that Joe's doings. How proud Mrs. March was when she knew it. How Joe laughed with tears in her eyes as she declared she might as well be a peacock and done with it. And how the spread eagle, that's the name of the newspaper, might be said to flap his wings triumphantly over the house of March as the paper passed from hand to hand. Tell us all about it. When did it come? How much did you get for it? What will father say? Won't Lori laugh, cried the family, all in one breath as they clustered about Joe. For these foolish, affectionate people made a jubilee of every little household joy. Stop jabbering, girls, and I'll tell you everything, said Joe, wondering if Miss Burney felt any grander over her Evelina than she did over her rival painters. So it's a reference to another author, and did she feel this proud about her publication first? Having told how she disposed of her tales, Joe added, and when I went to get my answer, the man said he liked them both but didn't pay beginners, only let them print in his paper and noticed the stories. It was good practice, he said, and when the beginners improved, anyone would pay. So I let him have the two stories, and today this was sent to me, and Laurie caught me with it and insisted on seeing it. So I let him, and he said it was good, and I shall write more, and he's going to get the next paid for, and I'm so happy, for in time I may be able to support myself and help the girls. Joe's breath gave out there, and wrapping her head in the paper, she bedewed her little story with a few natural tears. For to be independent and earn the praise of those she loved were the dearest wishes of her heart. And this seemed to be the first step toward that happy end. So an exciting end of this chapter. Okay, so we've talked a lot in this video about this inference and how you're going to make this inference. And there's clues that continue to be clues later in the chapter. Again, there's clues earlier in the book. So any of those quotes are acceptable quotes to support your answer. Um, and the final question is a vocabulary question. Selecting which sentence correctly uses the word nettled or the word nettled. So um, let me know if you have questions, fifth graders. I'm eager to hear about your break. I'm also eager to see what your inferences are and why those are your inferences. Uh, let me know if you need help. Goodbye.